Now, I know what you're thinking looking at that title. Yo, Luke's finally covering the lore implications of Master Chief having fun times with Arbiter's human female POW stand-in character. Let's go, I can't wait to see how this means the Flood are gonna come back. Well, you'll all be very happy to hear that, thank God we are not sacrificing our sanity talking about that today. My God. That's insane. What, you guys want me to start smoking again in videos? You know, I've got a lot of new ports left, so if you guys want to talk about the Halo TV show, then, uh, well, <laughs> I'm prepared. No, today we are flipping the script a little bit, and we're going to talk about arguably the stupidest, worst Halo story ever released. A story that did just about everything wrong. This story is called The Next 72 Hours, and it was so ridiculously dumb that it made fans want to start striking their own heads with hammers. So uh, if you happen to be watching this video with a hammer nearby, this is the closest thing that I could find to a hammer on demand, then uh, make sure you move those hammers into a different room. And once you've moved that hammer, make sure you subscribe down below and ring the bell because the next video that I release after this is going to cleanse all the mental anguish that this video will inflict on you. And trust me, you won't want to miss it. This story released in 2014 in the wake of Halo 4, which was simultaneously a very different but also very similar time for the Halo community. Halo 4 flopped pretty damn hard after launch. Its multiplayer died faster than our sanity seeing Master Chiefs Master Chiefs for the seventh time and Spartan Ops, which was Firefight's replacement, had been a huge disappointment. So much so that its second season of content was scrapped entirely. The story, however, was quite split. Depending on who you asked, it was either a fantastic continuation of Halo 3, but with more mature themes, or an overly complicated, cringy love story, which it wasn't a love story. Please stop saying that Halo 4 was a love story for the love of God. <laughs> so that put 343 in a pretty tough spot. They had two stories that they needed to continue. One that got cancelled halfway through despite it ending on a blatant cliffhanger, and one that was considered pretty polarizing. And so their answer to this conundrum was Halo Escalation, a comic book series that served to essentially act as Spartan Ops Season 2 while also keeping fans of Halo's main story satisfied over the three year gap between Halo 4 and the elusive Halo 5. A three year gap between Halo games. Oh, we did not know how good we had it, good lord. Escalation was pretty in line with Spartan Ops' characters and general themes, albeit with some of the expansiveness of Halo's expanded universe thrown in. But issue 8 came completely out of left field and shifted the story into a direct follow-on to Halo 4's campaign and the Master Chief story. This was the beginning of the next 72 hours, and we had no idea what a mess we were in for. The story begins a day after Halo 4's ending, so pretty much directly on, during Chief's debrief of Halo 4's events with only High Command in Sydney, including Lord Hood. Based on Chief's helmet cam footage, they conclude that his kill on the Didact was in fact not confirmed, given that his body fell into the slipspace fissure and was never actually found, but that the composer was successfully destroyed, rendering Earth safe from any future attacks which means that you're perfectly safe to enjoy gaming on one of my Flood-themed PCs, made in partnership with Apex Gaming PCs. That's right, we created three different tiers of Flood-themed PC builds. The Pure Form PC, the Gravemind PC, and the ultra-powerful Primordial PC, fit to run Halo and any other game at blistering frame rates and gorgeous resolutions. So if you want a game in style free from the ever lingering fear of a composer beam raining down from the heavens to extract your digital essence, then head over to the link in the description to pick one of these infected bad boys up. And if you do, make sure to use code hidden at checkout for up to $250 off your order. After the debrief, Lord Hood stops Chief and ropes him into another mission. When the Didact stole the Composer from Ivanov Station the day before, there was a science team on the surface of Gamma Halo, of which Ivanov was orbiting, who were being escorted by Spartan Black Team, who an hour prior had gone quiet. 
Now, at the time, Black Team had something of a cult following. Since the cliffhanger ending of their debut comic series, Halo Bloodline, Black Team hadn't even as much as been mentioned in Halo's lore, and that was over four years prior. Halo Bloodline seemed to strike a chord with a lot of fans as well because of how unique it was, its settings and its enemies in particular. So unique in fact that I may even do a video on it at some point because we've never really had anything like it. But the bottom line was that fans of Black Team had wanted to know what had happened to them for almost half a decade, and here they were, all of a sudden, getting name dropped. They were back. Now, a little bit of backstory. Black Team consists of Margaret 053, Roma 143, Otto 031, and Victor 101. Four Spartan II washouts that form a unique, unconventional warfare squad, and who were some of the only Spartans to ever report directly to Oni. They even wore a unique matte black Mjolnir Mark VI that had Roman numerals of their respective team members engraved onto their visors. So not only were they fan favorite characters that had been MIA for basically half a decade at this point, but they also were just really cool characters, both in their visual design and also their backstory. Anyways, Black Team's last report before they went quiet was an audio message that seemed to indicate that Prometheans had popped up on Gamma Halo, which at the time made no sense considering they should have been contained to Requiem. So, Chief journeys to Gamma Halo alongside the now reunited Blue Team to investigate, which at the time was a pretty big deal. Blue Team land on Installation 03 and immediately notice crawler tracks that lead in the direction of the Science Team and Black Team's last known location. And when they reach said location, we reach our first major blunder. The entirety of Black Team have been slaughtered off screen. Fans had waited over four years to see what happened to Black Team after the sick cliffhanger ending of Bloodline, and the reintroduction of these badass Oni Spartans is their death scene. This really pissed a lot of people off for obvious story reasons, but also for artistic reasons as well. Now, it's no secret that 343 radically redesigned Halo's art style with Halo 4. I mean, that topic is a horse deader than the one that we rode in on, Halo reference. And a lot of fans did not like this new artistic direction. So, when Black Team showed up again, miraculously still decked out in their bungee style Mark VI, it was like an artistic breath of fresh air. They looked incredible, untouched by any artistic change in direction, and they were deleted from the story alongside their classic looking armor in a single panel. Granted, the next issue did start with a little flashback that showed their death, but it didn't suddenly make it okay. What happened was, as they were guarding the science team, they started to see a load of these slipspace portals opening up above them, with what they thought was debris of some kind coming through, some of which lands near them, so they go to investigate. That debris ends up being the body of the Didact, who seems entirely unscathed after, you know, Chief detonated the pulse grenade in his chest at the end of Halo 4. The Didact then wakes up from his nap and single-handedly slaughters the entire squad with his bare hands. Granted, this tile does look pretty cool. So, not to go full cinema sins here or anything, right? But I'm gonna go full cinema sins. The sin tally is already up to two, if not three. Black Team have finally been brought back, only to be immediately killed off screen. The character that, at the time, it seemed was gonna be the main villain of 343's Halo Reclaimer trilogy is having crucial elements of his story revealed in a comic, not a game, and despite Cortana sacrificing herself and Chief giving his all to beat the Didact at the end of Halo 4, it turns out he's perfectly fine. He doesn't even have a scratch on him. Anyway, in the wake of Black Team's slaughtering, Blue Team are jumped by Prometheans before reaching the site where Ivanov Station's research team actually first excavated the composer. And not to give you whiplash or anything, but I'm not gonna lie, this next section is actually really cool. They descend into the unnaturally formed cave and reach what's called the Composer's Abyss, a repository of all the kind of still alive tortured souls that have been composed by the Composer, awaiting assimilation into a Promethean body. So for the record, all of the souls that you see here are people that were composed in New Phoenix at the end of Halo 4. Not only is this a really haunting shot, but at the end of the abyss is a portal which leads to a fully-fledged foreigner city on a distant planet, 
This place is the Composer's Forge, where the composers are, well, created. And it's here where the Forge's monitor, 859 Static Carillon, reports the human's advance to the Didact, who, again, looks really badass sat on the throne of the Forge. Like I said, a little bit of tonal whiplash, but we keep on going. As they wander the Forge, Blue Team finds six composers, which, when you add the one that was destroyed in Halo 4, makes seven composers. Nice. And here, they finally run into the Didact, who has Gamma Halo's activation index. Blue Team open fire, but the, the Didact... <laughs> Blue team open fire, but the Didact hits them with the old-fashioned shockwave stanky leg and knocks them all back before teleporting in a huge army of Prometheans that are in fact made from the souls of those that were composed at New Phoenix at the end of Halo 4. The Monitor then upholds his end of a bargain that he struck with the Didact and brings Gamma Halo to the Forge, but very quickly changes sides to aid Blue Team because of what the Didact actually plans to do with the Halo. His plan is to fire Gamma Halo in Earth's atmosphere and finish what he started in Halo 4. With one of the six composers in his possession, the Didact retreats through the portal back to Gamma Halo, and Blue Team and the Monitor follow. As they exit the composer's abyss, the Didact jumps them again and backhands Fred back to Onyx, quite literally. After a fight between the two, the Didact incapacitates most of Blue Team. But Chief gets the drop on him. He sneaks up behind him and stamps him in the eye with his combat knife, but <laughs> apparently, just like the pulse grenade on the Mantor's approach, it doesn't really bother him because he quite easily disables Chief and holds him up by the helmet, squeezing so hard that it starts to crush Chief's head and smashes his visor. He then throws Chief into Blue Team like a stack of bowling pins. Linda manages to land a binary rifle shot on the Didact, but he shakes it off with ease, so confidently so that he actually encourages an incapacitated Fred to land a point-blank face shot with a bolt shot so that he can grant him a warrior's death, which results in this panel, which makes him look like Nameless Didact. But before said warrior's death can be granted, Carolon stuns the Didact with his beam and teleports him away, by accident, to... The worst possible place, Gamma Halo's control room. It turns out, somehow the Didax armor had managed to adapt to Blue Team's weapons, making them basically do nothing to him, but Chief secured the Index, so there was a small victory. He plans to use the Index to kill the Didax in a way that he hasn't yet tried, and this plan is honestly, like many elements of this story, kinda cool, but also kinda dumb. Upon his request, the Monitor teleports Chief to the Didact's location. Again, Gamma Halo's control room. Chief has the Index in hand, which surprises the Didact, but he senses that there's a reason that they've just played right into his hand. Chief inserts the Index into the control hologram and deactivates the Halo's safety protocols. Then, the Monitor ejects the section of Gamma Halo with the control room on it from the ring and down to the surface of the planet that holds the Composer's Forge teleporting Chief to safety right before that section of the ring collides with the five remaining composers, which destroys them, and in the process, composes the Didact, ending his life, at least in the physical realm, in a panel that, well, is almost like a insulting way for a character of this caliber to go out. Now, it's dumb as hell to kill, or contain, as they said later, a character who is as important to the games as the Didact is in a comic, but <laughs> we'll get to that dumb point in a minute. The real dumb thing about this death, so to speak, is that Halo 4's terminals quite literally say that the Didact is immune to the composer. This man cannot be composed. Prior to turning his Promethean warrior servants into the digital Prometheans that we see in the games, the Didact conducted a number of experiments on himself to try and gain immunity to flood infection, but none of them worked. However, one of them gave him a new form, and although we don't know exactly what this new form entails, it altered something within him that made him immune to the composer. The procedure is a failure. I am still susceptible to flood infection. That leaves only the Composer. It will not work on my new form. Then you will lead us, as always. 
The Didact was an extremely honourable warrior servant and leader. If he knew that there was even a 1% chance that the composer would have worked on him, he would have taken that chance so that he could join his warriors in the digital realm and take down the flood with them. But he didn't, because he knew that he was immune. And yet, here we have him literally being composed just because a couple more composers were firing on him. It's not even like three million composers were firing on him. It was five. It wasn't a ridiculously high number. Rationalizing this is like trying to argue that you could put out a fire with gasoline as long as you just threw enough gasoline on it. It makes no sense, and honestly, it was about the lamest, most pathetic way for a character as significant as the Didact to essentially be written out of the story because that was the main goal of the next 72 hours. The Didact was meant to come back in Halo 5, but 343 decided to pivot the story after some of the backlash that Halo 4's story got, so they needed to get rid of him somehow. This is how they did it. Oh, but don't worry, many years later, they went back and confirmed that the Didact was contained, not killed. But for all intents and purposes, as far as Halo's main story is concerned, which the Didact was meant to be a core part of, he's dead. He, he may as well be dead. So not only did they bring back Black Team only to literally kill them instantly, not only did they resurrect and continue a game's main character's story in a comic, not only did said character seem perfectly fine after dying in a tremendous fashion at the end of Halo 4, not only did they bring him back just to kill him again because they pivoted their planned story in a significantly less direction, but they did so in a way that makes zero logical sense. In an enhanced version of Halo Escalation that released a few years later, this story's writer said that the Didact wasn't actually composed, but that the composers did something to him, which is all well and good, but he's in the domain in Halo Epitaph, or at least it sounds like he's in the domain, so he was composed? Honestly, God knows at this point. You know, as dumb as the next 72 hours was, I feel like that story is kind of symbolic of 343's just insane mishandling of the Didact post Halo 4. He was done so well in Halo 4, and it was clear that he was being set up to be the kind of main overarching villain of the Reclaimer trilogy or saga, as it later became. But they've pivoted the story and changed their plans so many times at this point that it almost feels like the Didact as a character has kind of fallen through the cracks and he's almost just stuck in perpetual story limbo now. And, you know, as excited as I am for Halo Epitaph and his return, I just don't like the fact that that book is referring to itself as the final fate of the Didact or something along those lines. The blurb for that book basically says that this is the last chapter of the Didact story, which, man, man, waste of potential. The bottom line, though, is that I think the next 72 hours as, as a story is simultaneously really stupid but also kind of cool like don't get me wrong it has some really really dumb moments but i think the bones of this story the kind of foundations are actually really cool and could have made for a really damn good true sequel to halo 4. Like, imagine if Halo 5's story was Chief and Blue Team on Gamma Halo hunting down the zombie Didact with the assistance of only Spartan Black Team instead of Osiris. Good God, that would have been uh, quite cool. I feel like Halo 5 is kind of like the game of what could have been. So many cool bones that just went into an awful body. <laughs> Anyways, that is what I think is the dumbest story in all of Halo's lore. Yes, you could argue that Halo 5 was worse in many aspects and you wouldn't be too far off with that assumption, but as somebody who loves the Didact so much, legit one of my probably top seven favorite, if not top five favorite Halo characters of all time, having them just like basically delete his character from the story in such a knee-jerk manner really, really sucked, and I know that I was not the only person that felt that. So, what do you guys think? Is this, to you, the worst story in Halo's main canon? Of course, this story is like Halo 2 compared to the Halo TV show, but like I said earlier, I really not expend any mental energy thinking about that thing ever again, so <laughs> we're not going to. So, I hope you guys enjoyed that little bit of a different video, a bit more comedic, but a bit more like lighthearted fun in a strange kind of way. If you did enjoy it, then, you know, show support down below, sub, like, all that kind of stuff. 
Next video is going to blow your proverbial socks off. Let me tell you, it's going to be a banger. It's going to be a banger. So with that said, I want to give a massive thank you to all of my amazing patrons for the continued support over there, as per usual. Thank you all so much for watching. I really appreciate it. And I'll catch you all in the next one.